Welcome back to a refactoring video for day nine, parts one and two actually. So this is our code for part one. And we've got two new implementations, one using successors and one using from function. We'll go over what those are in a second. The problem if you've forgotten is this list of numbers, I guess, I forget what they're called. We split the white space on each of these numbers. Then we have to do windows over these. So zero plus three, or three minus zeros, rather, nine minus six, et cetera, et cetera. So we end up with this solution where we split the white space, parse the numbers out. If all of the numbers in that bottom row are zero, then we're done. Otherwise, we tuple windows over all of them with the position, and we end up doing this like right minus left for every window of two. Now, this is an iter tools function. There are two relevant functions that could be used. One is map windows, map windows is nightly. It is exactly what it sounds like. It is that kind of windows plus an operation in the same way that find map exists or filter map exists. This is map windows. It's map and windows. Similarly on slices, there is already a windows and in nightly there is an array windows. So array windows is the same exact thing as windows, except for the fact that it is const generic, which means that the values that you get are definitely going to be an array of two elements here whereas the regular windows is just a slice. So those are all very interesting, but the biggest change for us is going to be using successors. And successors is a standard library function in standard iter successors that allows us to create a new iterator using the last item to produce the next item. So in this case, they have a one that gets passed in as the first item, and then a function that takes that value, does some multiplication on it, and that's the next value. So you can see how one becomes 10, a 10 would become 100, 100 would become 1000, and so on and so forth. So this is just an iterator now that runs this function every time it tries to produce its next value, passing in the old value. How is this useful for us though? We can take all of our inner logic and you can see how much smaller that file gets actually. So we did a bunch of stuff with a manual loop and our manual tuple positions and windows and whatever, as long as I don't <laughs> move that code to mess it up. And our part one for successors here does all the same stuff, except we use successors to pass in that first numbers array or that numbers vec. That numbers vec is then used to produce the next one. So every row we have is used to produce the next row. And we do this by first checking to see if all of them are zero. And if they're not, this is interesting right here because this is the same as putting parens around it and using the exclamation point, but it can be done in line here. And that's using the standard ops not trait. If this is not true, so if not all of them are zero, then we're gonna return a sum here and we're gonna use that nums to iterate over, grab our tuple windows, do the calculation we did and collect those into a vec and that vec is the next value. So then we get the next value the next time we do next and we go through the same thing. So this is the exact same logic just written in a far more concise way. We don't have to use a manual loop like we do here in the other part one and we don't end up having to use this iter tools position last or only or anything, which is really nice. So now that we have an iterator of all of the layers, we can map over that iterator and just get the last value from each layer and sum them up. This solution runs faster and more efficiently than part one. The details for the uh, allocation are in the commit. And of course the benchmarks I'll show later, but we can do one better. And I wouldn't necessarily say this is something that I would suggest doing in production, but there is another function called from function that is right next to successors. So if you go to the standard iter trait and you scroll all the way down, there's these functions here. And we've got from function, we've got once and once with, which we're not using today, we've got repeat and we've got successors. So this is from function here, and it creates a new iterator where each iteration calls the provided closure. The really interesting part of from function is that it allows us to mutate captured values. So in this solution, we only use a single vec for the entire line. So if we have this line here, we use a single vec to do all of the calculations for going all the way down to zeros. And we do that by first collecting all of our values as we expect, the same way we did it before, but this vec is now mutable. This gets moved into the closure, so we do our normal check to see if nums.iter is zero. And then we're doing something a little bit tricky here. We're using this thing called Windows Mute, and Windows Mute is not available in the standard Rust library. So we had to go pull in the lending iterator crate. And now I wanna be clear about one thing. I've only used the lending iterator crate in Advent of Code. I've never found a use for it outside of Advent of Code. I would probably, instead of using this in regular code, 
I would probably find a way to do it with the standard library, but I do think it's significantly interesting. And going through this crate and how it's implemented is a little bit outside of the scope of this video. You'll see some mention of things like higher kinded types and gats and things that we haven't covered in this series. But the big thing that it allows us to do is run Windows Mute, which allows us to take sliding windows like we were doing before of mutable references or exclusive references. So this is a thing that the regular iterator trait in Rust can't express currently. Thus, they define a new trait called lending iterator that can do this. Now, as with most things that implement sort of a custom iteration, we can't use for syntax because for loop syntax will call into iter under the hood, which relies, of course, on the iterator trait. So instead, we can while let. And this is just a regular destructuring. So read this as let sum sum destructuring equals it.next. So we take the iterator of Windows mute over nums. We have a mutable reference here. References can also be destructured is a really important thing to know. It is not terribly useful very often, but references are first class types and they can be destructured just like any other value. So in this case, we are destructuring here. We get a mutable reference to left and we just get right. So if we look at these, we can see that because of this ref mute, we're getting a mutable reference or an exclusive reference to left, which is the first value in the window. And then we get right as just a value. This allows us to set the left value equal to our calculation, which is right minus left. What this does is keeps this nums vec around forever. And as we iterate over all of the values in nums, what we're doing is updating the leftmost value to be the next ranks value. So if we look at this, right, if we look at the visualization of what should be happening here, we've got this row at the top here. We iterate over zero and three. This is left, zero is left, and three is right. So we do our calculation and we get three. We store three here in the original vec, and we keep doing that over and over. So we end up with, in this original vec, threes, that second row, as all of these numbers. And then we've got 15 at the end, just sitting there because we don't have enough values to actually reach that one in this case. Because of that, we can just pop that off the end of our vec. Our vec gets one smaller, which is what it does anyway, and we get that value out of this iterator. So from function has now used nums and the same vec over and over to create an iterator that pops off that last value to us. And we then get an iterator of all of the rightmost values. Of course, for part one, we just get to sum those up and then we're done. But from function successors, very interesting. The same logic works for part two. The big difference is instead of doing right minus left, because we're moving left to right in, a, in this vec that we're keeping for one vec, we do need to do this little reverse at the top here. So we reverse the original numbers, and then we do left minus right rather than right minus left, just reordering our vec so that the rightmost number when we pop for the vec is always the number that we want. You could use like a vec deck or something here instead. I chose not to. I probably should though. It would make it more clear. Part two for successors is much the same as the part one for successors. The only difference for successors is that we get the first value out of this iterator rather than the last. Because remember, successors is giving us every row, so we can just choose which end we want. And one thing that I think is really interesting is that these higher level approaches are actually faster. So if we look at these values, let me minimize this a little bit, make this a little bit bigger. If we look at these values for the benchmarks, right, we've got part one here. And part one runs in a median of 158 microseconds. So far, so good, right? The successors version runs in about 142. So we've dropped about 20. The version with a single vec runs in 90. So we've dropped another 50. Same thing for part two. Part two runs in about 208. The successors version runs in 154, which is about 50 less than that. And then the one vec version runs in 106, which is another about 50 less than that. So we're not just building up sort of higher level constructs and easier to read code, but this code is also getting faster. If we look at the DAT profile, we get 358 kilobytes for part one, 336, which is a drop of about 20 for the part one successors. And then the one that really has an impact on memory is the part one with the one VEC. So we're not allocating multiple VECs. Now we're just using one per row or one per line of input. So we get 97 kilobytes instead of 333. So you can see that these higher level constructs are actually giving us faster runtimes 
and less heap usage. Now, of course, this isn't always true. This is true in this case, but always, 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 if you are needing performance in some way, benchmark, make your changes, and then benchmark again to see what works for you. I hope this was an interesting introduction to the idea of both successors and from function. These are in the standard library. You just get to use them. They've been around since version 1.34, so they've been around for a while at this point. I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a great rest of your day. I'll see you for day 10.